Thank you so much. Oh, here we go. All right, uh, the recording has just started. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you've heard, my name is Lynette Mullen. I am right here in Eureka, local historian. Um, research a number of topics, uh, but really Eureka's Red Light District and some of the ladies in particular who worked in that district have captured my attention. And um, that has really been my main focus for a couple of years now. Um, so any questions? I wanna look real quick, just are there any questions before we get started? Okay, this is being recorded. So if at some point you do have to leave, uh, you will be able to catch the rest of the presentation later. So I am going to go ahead and start. Uh, I have a PowerPoint. Um, if you do have questions as I'm moving along, uh, please put them in the chat and we will make sure we address them. I've been told I have about an hour, um, but you could certainly get a hold of me later too, like I said, if you have to go. So with that, uh, oh, the cat is Kasha. Um, she is my office mate. I work out of my house and um, she, yes, yeah, there she is. Anyway, happy to have you all here. Thank you for coming. And with that, all right, if somebody could just let me know in the chat that you are seeing what I want you to see there. Yep, it looks good, Lynette. Perfect, okay. So the red light district, um, yes. So as Susan mentioned, um, I learned about Virginia Defray and that was during COVID. I would actually, I'm about a mile from Old Town and um, I worked out of my house, had a lot of time on my hands, as you can imagine. And I would walk down to Old Town and look at old buildings, um, or in this case, old parking lots, empty spaces, and wonder what was there. And I was actually looking at the waterfront parking lot. So between the new uh, Dick Taylor Chocolates building and Jack's, there's a big old parking lot there. And I looked in that parking lot and I thought, something must have been here once upon a time. And when I researched it, I found that the Scandia, that was the location of the Scandia. And that is where Virginia started working as a chambermaid after her husband deserted her. So she was a single mother, uh, six, seven children working there. When the two owners tried to force her into a life of shame, that was the way it was put there. Um, she refused and the owners beat her up. And that's actually um, the newspaper article that I found. And even though I had heard references to the red light district, gosh, the, I grew up here. So I've always kind of heard stories. Um, I never really paid attention and I had never focused any research on it until then. Uh, the story about Virginia, and just the, the situation she was in and the hardships I can only imagine she faced uh, got me more interested in the topic. And when I started diving in, I found there was a wealth of information, um, not only in documents, but even in photos. So this is the Western Hotel. It was down on First Street in Eureka. And I'd seen this photo multiple times just because it's such an amazing building. But when I started looking more carefully, you can see the ladies here in the window. And I would guarantee you that no proper ladies are going to be hanging out of a window like that in the early 1900s. So I'm sure these were some of Eureka's working girls. So I started thinking more and researching. And when you think about the history of prostitution, there are a number of ways to look at it. Um, some people think about this. So there was a book written in the 1800s. This is one of the, the illustrations there by Degas. It was, um, it's very sensual, right? Um, uh, kind of a man's world, but the women are accommodating and that sort of thing that they are there willingly. Um, and that was certainly true for some, right? There were, very few opportunities for women to have their their autonomy, their freedom, uh, ways to even travel on their own, let alone own property, um, let alone just control even their day and what they wanted to do. Um, and so for some women, it probably was a choice. It was a choice. I've read a couple of autobiographies where women talk quite openly about the fact that they chose this as their profession. But unfortunately, many didn't. Um, there were others, uh, poverty, if you think about it, you know, there was no welfare in the 1800s, early 1900s. Um, if a woman was deserted or widowed or had children or an elderly parent to support, there were very few ways to do it. And even if they did work, say at a laundry 
or something like that, uh, very often they did not make enough money to support themselves, let alone anyone else that might be dependent on them. Unfortunately, prostitution was one of the few places they could go, one of the few jobs that they could get where they could make enough money to support themselves and the others that depended on them. Um, there were also, ironically, constructs uh, within our society during that time um, that opened that door for certain women. So there was, uh, and it started in the 1800s uh, with the gold rush. Uh, there was a book, Gold Diggers and Silver Miners by Marion, Marion, man's name, Goldman. And he talked about the volcano theory of sexuality. And the idea was that even though women were pretty asexual, they really didn't have a sex drive. And, and frankly, something was wrong with them if they did. Um, men, on the other hand, did. They had this insatiable drive. It was instinctual. They couldn't help it. Um, and if they didn't have a regular outlet, women, uh, with which to release that tension, um, they would erupt in orgies of adultery, rape, physical violence, and even, oh God, homosexual embraces. So there were some, well, what we see now is kind of ridiculous ideas about human sexuality, but in fact, they were pervasive. Um, and so with that, thinking, you know, on the one hand, that proper women didn't even want sex, and basically it was just for procreation, but yet you had men um, that were desperate and, and had all this energy, prostitutes were the answer. So you think about that, and then you think about the dynamics here in Humboldt County. So in 1852, Humboldt County was actually a part of Trinity County. We had in the census, the 1852 census, should about 1,750 men and 23 women. So you can imagine um, what the dynamics were there. Um, hot ground, excuse me, for um, opportunity for a particular industry to thrive. And it did. So the early houses of prostitution in Humboldt County. Um, in 1855, there was a man named Grunmond, a dastardly ruffian, the newspaper said, who shot Henry Rohner. And this was actually Henry Rohner of Rohner Park and Rohnerville. Um, they had gotten into some sort of an altercation. Grunman, the paper admitted, owned and ran houses of ill repute, even though it was humiliating to state this to the public. Um, so it was embarrassing uh, for people in the county, um, even uh, newspaper reporters, to even admit that there were brothels here in Humboldt County in the 1850s. Of course, there were, though, uh, and the first arrest record that I can find um, was Isabella Kingsley. So Isabella was, was arrested for running a house of ill fame. Um, the witnesses, of course, were only men. Women couldn't be witnesses in the court and have any credibility. Um, but the witnesses called to testify against Isabella, the men who knew her best, um, said, of course, she's not a prostitute. Of course, that's not a brothel. Um, and she was acquitted. Uh, in the 1870s, many of the newspaper articles that we had here, media coverage here in the county, talk about vagrancy laws. So, of course, there were houses of ill repute by that time. But really, the focus um, was on the customers. Uh, it was pretty appalling, especially the ones that would go and live off the women in the houses of ill repute. And so they were really targeted. It wasn't so much the ladies. Because again, I think there was kind of this reluctant up, uh, acceptance of this particular profession. In the 1870s, they also, though the newspapers would talk about the dangers of body houses um, for boys and girls, of course, uh, wayward girls, but then even men, there were dangers there. And even by the 1870s, of course, they knew that there were diseases, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia uh, that were prevalent. And so the risks were there. Um, one of the ways that the public became aware of prostitution, unfortunately, was the coverage. And this was, there wasn't a lot of media um, coverage when it came to prostitution in general, but Chinese prostitutes were in the paper a lot. Uh, and the reason why is because there were a number of women, thousands over the years, that were kidnapped or sold by their families, smuggled into the U.S., and auctioned off. Uh, while there is, I have not found at least any evidence 
that that sort of activity happened here where the women were actually being auctioned, um, I would guarantee that some were sold and brought up here. Um, I do have reference, ran across reference to China Mary. So China Mary was here by the late 1870s. She was actually running an opium den, um, but in 1880, she was in the county hospital suffering from syphilis. Uh, which tells me that she, at least early on, was probably a prostitute, and maybe she was able to escape that particular business um, and was running an opium den uh, by the 1880s. Um, of course, then, for those that are familiar with Humboldt County's history, in 1885, uh, the Chinese residents in Humboldt County were expelled. Um, and at that point, many of the residents in Humboldt County justified that uh, by saying that the Chinese uh, citizens were the ones that brought vice to Humboldt County, and now that they were out, uh, of course, gambling, um, prostitution, and uh, the uh, overindulgence of liquor and drugs uh, would go away and everything would be better. Of course, none of that happened. And so what did happen? How did the communities here in Humboldt County address prostitution? Well, let's start with Ferndale. Um, so that house on the hill operated in Ferndale since at least the 1880s. Uh, people knew about it. I think there was a reluctant, a reluctant acceptance of this particular brothel. It was located for folks that are familiar with Ferndale between the two cemeteries. So if you go to the end of the main town of Ferndale, you can turn left on Ocean. There'll be a cemetery on the right side of the street. You keep going on that road, and eventually you'll see the Catholic cemetery. The brothel is right in between them. Um, that brothel was there. And in 1893, um, Edna Gardner, actually it was the fall of 1892, Edna Gardner, um, a lady that worked on the house on the hill, uh, wanted to build a new brothel. And so she, in 18, January of 1893, uh, started construction on a new brothel. Maybe it was the end of 92. Um, everyone knew about it. Uh, no secrets from Ferndale. Um, and so women, so the night, the day that construction began, that night, uh, the wives and daughters of Ferndale's prominent citizens showed up at the house uh, that was still under construction. They tied a rope to one end of the foundation. They tied the other end of the rope to a horse. And they had the horse pull the house off the foundation. Um, and they succeeded actually in undermining a corner of the house before the, the constable showed up. So he stopped the ladies. Uh, the next week, Edna was charged with running a house of prostitution, but of course she hadn't even finished her house. So she could not have been running it. She was acquitted. Uh, building continued on the house. Um, and if you look at the picture here, uh, it might help you picture it too. Here's the Methodist church. And it was kind of kitty corner to that church next to the cemetery. This is before the cemetery really has um, many folks in it yet. But um, so Edna built her house, uh, started operating the house. Um, in May, word got out um, that neighbors uh, were going to try to stop Edna from operating the house under the Nuisance Abatement Act. And there was an action filed with the court um, that may then uh, rumors uh, went around Ferndale saying that the folks that had been visiting Edna's house had been recorded, people had been watching, and that those folks would be called to testify in this abatement act. Um, I cannot guarantee that it was people afraid of being called to testify, but what I can say is the last, the end of May, uh, the night watchman smelled smoke um, and found Edna's house on fire. So Edna's house had burned to the ground and so did the town hall next door. Um, so Ferndale, at that point, Edna had given up. Uh, she still owed money on the house she no longer owned. Uh, so she went back to Eureka. And Ferndale was comforted in knowing that they only had the one brothel to deal with. Arcata. So Arcata, um, in the early 1900s, there were two women. And of course, there were probably other houses here. But this is what I've been able to found. There were two women, Irene Manning and May Roy, who wanted to set up a house. Um, their neighbors were not happy. There was a, a gentleman by the name of William Lindsay, who ironically was involved in the Indian Wars and had absolutely no problem killing Native Americans, but he did have a problem with naked ladies. And so he complained and complained. Um, he said the leaving of the curtains were open when the lights were on, inmates of the house were making their toilet basically in the restroom. 
Um, but while scantily dressed, if dressed at all, and he just couldn't stand it. Um, so he successfully had their house closed down. Um, but what that meant is there was more opportunity in Arcata. And so a couple of years later, a woman named Minnie Lewis established a shady house in the center of Arcata. The actual house still stands. You folks may recognize it. Nice it. It's at the corner of 10th and F Street in Arcata. But again, the neighbors weren't having it. Um, the town was not uh, ready to support or even accept um, houses of ill repute, whether operated quietly if they knew about it or operated more openly, which is from the sound of it is what Minnie was doing. And so the town successfully closed that brothel down too. Now, while there were other smaller establishments in other parts of the county, really Eureka is where the industry focused. And so there we are. There's an early, early picture of Eureka. So in 1885, Eureka still wasn't ready to accept uh, this is an industry or business, at least openly, and there were morality ordinances uh, prohibiting houses of prostitution, gambling, I mean, even uh, uh, obscene language um, was illegal and you could be arrested for using obscene language in public. Um, so people were trying to keep Eureka clean. But by 1896, clearly the city had given up on that uh, when they issued a statement saying that no officers, this means police officers, were allowed in houses of prostitution while on duty. Um, so that tells you basically they gave up, but they said, cops, at least please don't go. Don't go when you're working. Um, and for the most part, I think they probably obeyed that, but probably not completely. So when we talk about Eureka districts, where are we talking about? So the lower fourth is what it was known as um, until 1913, and I'll talk about that in a little bit here, but this was it. So if folks are familiar with Eureka and the co-op, this is the corner of 4th and B Streets. Um, these houses below that you can see below the co-op there, those were actually houses of ill repute. Um, we think of them as being fancy, and there were a number of different types of houses. Um, while there were some ladies that operated in single houses or what were called cribs, um, these were more, um, maybe not parlor houses, which were super fancy houses, but these were brothels that normally generally held uh, two, three, four, maybe even five or six women, depending on the house, the size of the house. Um, and so this gives you some idea. Um, there are uh, sandboard insurance maps, which are really fun. And if you want to ask me at the end of this presentation, I can put a link in the chat. Um, the map started like 1886 and went through like 1940 something. Um, and they're just, they're a blast for someone like me anyway. But you can picture, you can actually spot a lot of the brothels in a community because they use the euphemism female boarding. Um, and that was a town's way of indicating where the brothels were. Um, and so you can see in this map here, uh, female boarding, female boarding. Um, it, the lower fourth went along uh, fourth street here. So this is actually the block between uh, B and C street on fourth. It's where the veterans housing building is now. Um, those houses that you see, that two story house on the corner there, that's actually Minnie Lewis's house. So that was the one that she had in Eureka when she tried to open a second resort as they were sometimes called um, in Arcata. Uh, so the, uh, her house, I haven't found a specific name for it, but there was, say, the house of Camille on B Street, the Iron Gate, and the Iron Gate was right there on 4th. Um, there was the Fresno house. Uh, number 15 was a house on B Street. So there were a number of different names, um, but others just used the name, you know, it was uh, maybe Mamie's Place or something like that. Uh, so it, it kind of varied, right? Businesses varied, names of businesses varied. Um, and so while there was this specific district, even back then, um, there were also scattered houses in Old Town. Um, so this is where Good Relations is. Uh, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, Good Relations there. Um, at one point, though I haven't found proof of this, I do know that um, Kitty Ferris ran a house of ill repute. She actually inherited the property in the brothel from her husband when her alcoholic husband died, um, and it's been called the Joy Emporium. And so that was in Old Town there. Um, and so there were houses there as well. So Eureka had all these houses of ill repute. They finally went, okay, you know, we don't want our officers in there. 
but what else are we going to do, right? There's this whole thriving industry. Um, and so in the early 1900s, what they would do, uh, they would not issue the women liquor licenses. And liquor was a big way that these ladies made money in the brothels. Yes, they charged for the men to visit the ladies. But they also usually sold uh, beer, wine, whiskey. A bottle of beer was usually a dollar, even if it cost much, much less for the ladies. Um, and it was another way for them to earn money. Um, and so what would happen is periodically these houses would be raided. You can tell this all happened on October 30th of 1900, and all these women were arrested for selling intoxicating liquors without a license. Um, but it was kind of haphazard. Uh, people didn't know if it was the right approach, wrong approach. Um, in 1901, there was a, a Eureka City Council person that suggested just taxing them. Let's tax them $10 every quarter for every occupant. Because again, these ladies were making money. The city wanted to take advantage of that. If they weren't going to close the district, how could they capitalize on what was frankly a pretty thriving business in Eureka? Um, that did not go over well. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the council was not happy with the idea of taxing these ladies, but they had another idea. So they had a discussion and they realized, and this was a very public discussion held in the papers, um, they realized that if they charged these ladies with either running houses of ill repute or being inmates, that it violated a state law and the county would get the funds, the fines, that sort of thing. Where if they did, as they did on 1900 there, if they charged these ladies with selling intoxicating liquor without a license, then they were violating the city ordinance and the city would get the funds. And so that's what they did. From 1903 to 1910, with a little bit of stopping there in between, the city of Eureka would fine on a regular basis, usually it was twice a year, they would arrest and charge all of these ladies with selling intoxicating liquor without a license. It got to where literally the day before it happened, a police officer would go around and let the madams know it was time. The madams would line up, they would get charged, uh, they would pay their bail, um, $30 it started, they would forfeit their bail. So basically they'd pay the bail, they'd leave, um, they would forfeit their bail, the city would keep it, and that would be the end of it for six months. Um, that happened over and over again for years. Um, at one point I found a newspaper article that said the city of Eureka was one of the most fiscally solvent cities um, in California, in large part, quite frankly, to the funds, the money that the city was earning literally on the backs of these ladies. The other thing the city did, and I found this very ironic, this was actually never in the paper, but even though the city would not license these women, would not grant them liquor licenses so that they could operate legally, they did require them to get a trader's license. Um, and in the previous list, there are women like Minnie Lewis, who I'd mentioned, Irene Church, um, who else? I can't read. There's a million of them. Um, and on this list is these women listed again um, when they pay for a trader's license. Um, so the city did require that. Um, and this record was in the city hall in the basement in the archives. Um, it has proved very useful in helping to identify where these houses were located. Um, the other thing that was helpful, so this actually came from the Clark Museum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is still when the houses are in the lower fourth. So this is before 1913, and there were 32 houses of ill repute specifically identified um, on this map in Eureka. So literally hundreds of women were working in this particular industry. So how did they get there? Um, there were a number of ways. I, I talked a little bit about uh, women who were impoverished, women who were desperate, women who were deserted, maybe. I mean, even if you did succeed in getting married, there was no guarantee your husband was going to stay with you or provide you with what you needed. Um, there were also women maybe who um, were single, vulnerable, maybe struggling, who met a charming, attractive, might even claim to be wealthy man um, who promised to marry a woman, uh, usually a younger girl. Um, this younger girl might believe him, might be charmed. And then, of course, the argument was, well, if we're going to be married, why wait until marriage to have sex? You know, we're that close to being married anyway. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of girls were ruined this way because they would succumb. 
um, they would sleep with a the man, they would end up pregnant, uh, which was evidence of their indiscretion, and then the men would leave. Um, that happened over and over, and at that point, really, the woman was not considered um, a pure a good, or good girl anymore. Um, she was not a marriageable girl, and she had very few options ahead of her. Um, but even if, so this is George Duncan. So um, Goldie, uh, Goldie Russell was her name, the name that she had when she lived in the district here in Eureka. George here married Goldie, which is something the working girls were always hoping for, right? That one of their customers would come and marry them and, and carry them out of this particular life. Well, George married Goldie, but instead of carrying her out of the life, he went down to San Francisco, um, required her to keep working up here, required her to keep sending him money and would in fact find ladies in San Francisco and send them up here to work for Goldie. Not a very nice guy. This is another one. This is Harry Harris. So Harry Harris married. I'm guessing that this particular young lady was not a prostitute before we, they got married. But once they did, charming Mr. Harris here, forced his wife into a life of prostitution. And women at that point, you have to remember, they had no rights of their own. Basically, once they were married, they belonged to their husband, no different than property. So this poor girl here literally had no choice but to do what her husband made her do. So with that, we will go back to the district. So um, even though the city was pretty openly accepting of the district, uh, in 1908, we had a new mayor, Mayor Ricks. Um, mayor Ricks was not happy with the open practice of prostitution. Um, he was trying very hard to do something about it. Rather than close it down completely, what he suggested we do is confine the ladies. That way uh, they didn't have to be seen um, if people didn't want to see them. They didn't contaminate the proper young ladies. Um, and so he confined the district to the lower floor. Uh, the police chief was supposed to enforce it. And in fact, he did. Um, all women of Annie's class, Annie was one of the ladies and that was arrested when she went outside the district of Eureka. So she went outside the lower floor and she was literally arrested and put in jail. Maisie Elmer was another woman who was arrested for being outside of the district. Poor Maisie was fined $50, the equivalent of over $1,500 today. And that was literally just as a human being going outside of the district. Well, this, as you can imagine, was very frustrating for the ladies um, and even the customers, right? Because then it became very obvious um, if any a particular man uh, entered this area, then it was very clear as to what he was doing and why. Uh, and so the ladies, the madams, and I've never been able to find the, the names, but they came up with an idea. Now, this picture, unfortunately, is not the boat that we ended up with here in Humboldt County. Um, this is Santa Cruz, so this may not have been an original idea. I'm not sure which community came up with it first, but there were a number of madams that got together. Um, pulled their resources and hired a man to build a boat. Uh, he built it on Gunther Island, as it was known then, Indian Island or Toluata, as it is now. Um, he built the boat. He swears he had no idea who he was building it for. He was just contracted to build a boat. Uh, but once that built, boat was built, the newspaper reported, women of the half world and their male consorts, secure from the vigilance of the police, um, were visiting the boat and the place had been the scene of the wildest orgy. So basically they were conducting business there. So they found a way to get out of the district um, and not get arrested. But of course, Eureka didn't like it. Uh, over time, uh, if you've been to Old Town and you've been near the water, noise carries. Uh, people know this was going on. People did not like it. So that floating house of vice, uh, in June of 1908, the people of Eureka said it's got to go. And so they moved it to Arcata and Arcata went, uh-uh, we're not having it here. Um, so then the ladies, and again, I'm not sure who yet, uh, but there were ladies that purchased property in Fields Landing. And the idea was actually to move the boat onto land and basically transform it into a building. Um, but the folks in Field Landing heard about this. There was a mass meeting 
in the community of field planning where they said, we are not going to let this happen. And they actually had a guard stationed to guard the rail where the boats would have come across to keep that from happening. Um, I have not heard what ended up happening to that boat, but that basically shut that down. Um, and I didn't explicitly, I have not read um, that uh, the boat was gone or or what happened to the boat, but I'm guessing that that shut down that particular business um, and that the district was opened again because clearly uh, newspaper accounts after this period of time, the women are traveling outside of the district. So who were some of these women? I've talked about Minnie Lewis um, and there were others like her and most of them quite frankly were uh, Caucasian. They were white women um, and part of that probably was the history of Humboldt County. Um, as I talked about, the Chinese were expelled from Humboldt in 1885. Um, it unfortunately, uh, this is a very ugly part of our history, um, but the, our county would even brag about the fact that there were no Chinese within Humboldt County. Um, there were very few other minorities. So in the 1900 census, while well, we had over 25,000 uh, white individuals, there were only 12 African Americans. Um, so very, very white community. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't changed all that much, though we are diversifying some. Um, but that particular situation did not stop an African American madam named Mamie Wright from coming into Humboldt County. So Mamie operated a house when she came in uh, at the corner of 4th and B, so right in the heart of the lower fourth there. She was there, um, but people were not happy about it. She, oops, I, I, excuse me one second, I need to mute my phone. <laughs> my apologies for that. Um, so Mamie came in, she was operating a house, she was operating it quietly, quite frankly, um, I think she was being very careful to stay under the radar and not give anyone um, a reason to target for her or arrest her or harass her, um, but that only lasted so long. In 1909, uh, a reform movement, again, right? Uh, Ricks, I'm sure, was still involved in this. Um, they were looking at the district in Eureka, and while a lot of people didn't mind it, certainly there were more and more that did. And so they targeted, Mamie Wright was arrested, um, and there was a local attorney that actually pressed charges. So back then, you could uh, file a complaint uh, with the police, and individuals could have people arrested for violating the law. And so there was an attorney named E.M. Frost, um, and the good government league took some credit for it, but really Frost was in the lead in targeting Mamie Wright. I'm mean, accusing her of running a house of prostitution. The community, the reformers were very excited. They said, oh, this is the first step in cleaning up Eureka. Um, the ladies were told they could no longer sell liquor without a license. So of course that only lasted so long. Um, and Mamie was arrested and charged with living in a disorderly house. She was taken to jail. Um, and was there for a period of time. And initially, and of course the community believed that this was a reform movement, but in fact, Frost had been charged by, uh, she'd been hired, excuse me, by a woman who had worked for me and had lived in Maine's house. And there was a practice of a lot of times, um, clothing had more value, quite frankly, than it does right now. And women could literally mortgage or soak um, or pawn is another way to put it, their clothing for money. And this particular inmate of Mamie's had done that. She had soaked a trunk of clothes uh, and had gotten money from Mamie. Um, she wanted her clothes back and didn't want to pay Mamie what she owed her. Um, and so Frost instituted this entire thing to get Mamie's house empty so he could go into the house and retrieve his client's clothes. In fact, later, uh, Frost worked for Mamie. So he had absolutely no moral issue. Um, he was had nothing to do with any sort of reform. Um, so that was one of the first times that Mamie came to the spotlight. There were many others. Um, in 1912, again, reformers tried again. Um, it was kind of a cyclical thing. In April of 1912, uh, folks in Eureka were saying, we need to clean up this district. We need to get ladies out of here. Um, they were driving women out, period. But if you notice in this particular article, it says 
that a ban is being placed on quote, colored women, their rent having been doubled by the owners of the house. So this was more specifically targeting African-American women, even though uh, the newspaper also said, and the chief said they had about 300 women that they had succeeded in driving out of the community. Um, Mamie though, wasn't leaving. Um, I have tracked her back, but there was something about Eureka. Um, by this time, she had a number of uh, business partners. Um, she wasn't going anywhere. Unfortunately for her and for a woman that worked for her um, in 1912, in November of 1912, there was a customer that assaulted one of her girls, basically attempted to kill the girl. Fortunately, he did not succeed, um, but he ended up dying. Uh, either self-imposed suicide, though what they said is that the man had been attacking the girl with a knife, trying to split her throat. When Mamie came into the room, he took his little knife and stuck it in the back of his own neck, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'm actually guessing that maybe Mamie killed him to protect her girl. Um, either way, it brought Mamie back into the spotlight. Um, everybody said she had to go. And then, of course, um, she initially said they were targeting her in particular. The city had to prove they weren't. So they focused on the district, uh, the lower fourth, again, as it was called, um, or the lower district. Um, and what they did, what the city did, actually, it was the property owners. I don't know how much this was the actual property owners of the neighboring properties or if it was the city and driven by the mayor. But they hired a private attorney that wrote letters to the owners of the brothels. So most of these ladies did not actually own the houses that they operated. Um, they would lease the houses. They would run the business. They would collect the rents and the fees from the ladies, um, pay the landlord, that sort of thing. And I have read multiple times that these ladies were actually very desirable tenants. Um, because they didn't want to make waves, they didn't complain, they paid higher rents, um, and they were always on time. And so in this particular reform movement, they are targeting the owners of those properties. Uh, they wrote, this attorney wrote letters. Um, there was a push that property owners initially ignored, but by February of that year, they had succeeded and all of the brothels were closed uh, in the lower fourth. Though ironically, not long after, the property owners in that area actually petitioned the city um, because the houses were empty. They couldn't rent them to others. Um, they petitioned for a lowering of property taxes. So it actually ended up uh, significantly reducing the revenue that the city of Eureka was receiving from that area. Um, and so where did they go? So of course there were always scattered bustles in Eureka. Um, the Alpine here is a pretty famous one though. Uh, there were rooms upstairs there um, and the footprint actually is still like it was. So there were plenty of brothels. And the city knew even when they closed the district that they wouldn't lose, that the women wouldn't all leave. Um, they had just decided they didn't want a vice district in particular anymore. Um, Mamie, the woman that I talked about, moved here to the Pioneer Hotel. So the Pioneer, the building isn't there anymore, but you folks from Eureka or Vince Eureka may recognize this. This is on First Street. Um, this is uh, at the corner of First and F. The waterfront is right to the right there. You can barely see it. Um, so the Pioneer Hotel was there. Um, and even though Mamie denied it, denied it, denied it, she did run a brothel there. She ended up being prosecuted again in 1916. Um, and it came out that she was running a $2 house. So basically customers were charged $2. There was a 50 cent bed fee. So for every customer, a lady entertained at that particular brothel. Uh, and it does look like a hotel. You can imagine the rooms inside there. Um, the ladies paid 50 cents. Uh, Mamie also served uh, food, and she did that just for people that showed up, for the ladies, um, and sometimes the men that visited. So, of course, uh, the business continued. Eureka continued to struggle, and actually this became an issue all over the country. Um, and Eureka ended up following some of the other states and cities around the country in using um, an abatement act. So, basically, they would tell property owners that they needed to stop uh, the activities within a brothel um, or the house would be closed, the building would be closed for a year. Um, and so they used that thread, it was pretty effective. Um, a lot of them were closed up, uh, it would be called rooming houses. And actually this particular article in June said that the ladies were leaving, um, but they'd actually gone on the police 
chief and said, can we have one more day to pack up our stuff before we have to go? And that was granted. Um, city kept working on it. This was June of 1916. And by June 19th, the city said, we're free of brothel. They're all gone. Of course, that wasn't true. Um, October of 1916, Mr. Weaver and his wife, they had run this laundry that's no longer there on First Street. They had the waterfront what is now the Waterfront Cafe uh, was a number of other businesses before they were running a brothel. Um, they received an injunction to close their business. They just ignored it. Uh, Weaver at one point was fined $500, I think, um, for ignoring it, um, but it really didn't work. But they tried, the city kept trying, kept trying, kept trying. 1925, these, uh, are some of the houses that were operating. Of course, the Weaver place is still operating. It's still listed. It was actually ran by Weaver's wife. The Pioneer Hotel, uh, the place that I'd mentioned uh, where Mamie was, was back in operation. And Carnegie was the one running it for a man named Paul Enfield. Um, so of course, even though the city kept trying, well, they would keep trying and keep trying. Um, and unfortunately, the business did continue, as well as the dangers. So one of the things that I ran into here um, was a story about Minnie McCoy. So Minnie McCoy's body was found uh, just outside of Oric in 1930. And I became interested in this uh, just because uh, a woman named Janice Murray became involved um, in trying to protect one of the witnesses. And so I dove deeper into it. I learned about Minnie McCoy. So Minnie had been living in Colorado. Her and her husband split up, which 1930 is a pretty big deal. So I'm guessing she left a bad situation. She was living in Marysville when she met this guy. And this guy was uh, Clarence King. They were together. They traveled uh, throughout the West, uh, the Western states, even into Arizona. Turns out he was trafficking her. Um, turns out he got tired of her, but not her money. Um, ended up killing her um, and left her body outside of Oric. Um, this is the lady. I had found this, actually, the North Coast Journal printed this picture, and it just really struck me. I eventually found out that this is Janet Murray. And after the murder, when Clarence King was getting ready for trial, there were rumors going around that one of the witnesses was in danger, a man named Martell. And this woman, Janice Murray, warned Martell, um, but Janice was a known prostitute. And Martell basically went, I don't know this lady. Um, Janice was arrested for prostitution. So even though she was trying to warn somebody, um, and actually people did end up shooting at Martell. He survived, but he really was in danger. Um, she was arrested and charged with prostitution. Um, fortunately, Clarence, was convicted. Um, he was actually sent to San Quentin, and you can see in the top of the picture there, the police, re the prison record, he is marked dead. He was executed in December of 1931. And so now, today, I mean, the story that could go on and on, clearly, um, I have a lot of fun doing that. Um, but how did Eureka do? Well, in the 1940s, um, that there was actually an order from the army to close down the brothels here in Eureka because they were close to a military base. Um, and the army by that time was very uh, familiar, unfortunately, with the health risks that came along with uh, close proximity of military bases and red light districts because of the diseases. Uh, there were a number of these uh, syphilis, gonorrhea. Um, and syphilis, of course, I think folks probably know that there are many health complications, but even gonorrhea untreated um, is a systemic disease. Um, and so the military was trying to stop it. Um, if they did, if the Eureka, the Eureka succeeded, it certainly wasn't for long because by the eight, 1950s, again, they're talking about closing the district. Um, and of course, the industry still has not gone away. It's changed a lot. When I was a kid, um, you could see street walkers uh, in Old Town. So of course, the Old Town area was still the Vice District. A lot of the industry has gone online, um, but it never has gone away. Um, today's situation, of course, is not the topic for today. So I will end it with thank you very much for coming today. Um, I appreciate everybody showing up and listening. And I, at this point, am going to close it out and ask if anybody's got questions. Uh, 
Um, there was a question when you were talking about the census. Um, would Chinese women have been counted in the early census counts? Yes, there were. Uh, there were a number of Chinese folks. I think many more um, in 1880s and actually lived here. Uh, there were many more in Eureka and in Humboldt County than were counted in the census. But if you go to the 1880 census, um, Ancestry.com if you're a member, but sometimes you can get lucky and find just some copies online too. Um, that uh, there there were some ladies that were listed. Um, there's another question. What did they do with all the children? That's a whole boy. We could take hours for that. Yeah, one of the um, the serious risks. I mean, disease of course was always a risk. Violence was always a risk for the the women that worked. Um, but pregnancy was also a risk, big risk. There were rudimentary birth control methods. Um, but they often didn't work. Uh, these women would turn to abortion. Um, but unfortunately, as you will learn next week, actually in the North Coast Journal, I have a story going out on the history of early abortion here in Humboldt. It was incredibly dangerous. Um, but some women would do that. Uh, some would use local providers. Others would go as far as San Francisco or probably Portland. Um, the other thing, women would have children. I have heard, I haven't been able to prove this, but the house on the hill in Ferndale that I talked about, the woman that's living there now, I found the owners and they allowed me to tour their house. And they heard that, that early on when that brothel was operating, that there was actually a separate house at the bottom of the hill where the ladies' children and the retired um, inmates, so prostitutes that, that frankly got too old really to work in the profession anymore, uh, that they would all live down there so that the women on the hill could see where their children were, knew that they were safe, but kept them separate. Um, a lot of the ladies would also board them out. They would find families that would raise uh, their children for them. Um, if they were lucky, they had family members that would do that. Um, it was very difficult. There were some, especially in New Orleans, um, I read about accounts where the, the children just grew up in the brothels along with their parents. Okay. Um, let's see. Someone was asking, are there ancestors of the madam still living in the area that you know? Oh, absolutely. Oh yeah, our uh, descendants. Yes, absolutely. I was. Um, I didn't include it today, but when I did a presentation at the Clark, there was a woman that that came up to me and and said, "Have you ever heard this particular name?" And I said, "You know, as a matter of fact, she's in my presentation." Um, so certainly, yes, there are. Okay. Um, let's see. Another question: What's the status of your forthcoming book? <laughs> So um, it's taking a lot longer than I expected. So it is nonfiction and it's focused on Mamie Wright. Uh, the woman, the African-American woman that I mentioned was here. She was here by the fall of 1905, but, but I have tracked her back to Telluride in 1891 and I'm kind of working forward from there. So I'm working on the first chapter and I tell people I'm literally in Telluride right now. She went from there to Leadville. So um, my hope is to get that first chapter done and a book proposal, um, but I'm, hopefully this year, um, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I took a couple of months to really focus on that, but unfortunately I've got to feed her and pay my bills. And <laughs> so I've taken on some client projects. So trying to balance those things, but still get it done. Um, how many years did Ferndale have operating brothels? <laughs> so, so the house on the hill, first references I found was the late 1880s. Um, and it was still, I mean, 1915, even 1920. I mean, Ferndale didn't like to think that they had brothels. Um, and I, gosh, I somewhere, I have a file that talked about Ferndale. And I think it was like 1916 that Ferndale said, no more, we're done. We don't have them anymore. But I don't even think that was true. I think people just got better at hiding it, right? Okay. Um, and it looks like all the questions that we have in here. Um, let's see. Oh, and what about in Blue Lake? I'm trying, oh my God, I'm well, sorry. <laughs> so Blue Lake's interesting. So Blue Lake, um, there was a woman, um, gosh, her name's escaping me right now, who lived out in Blue Lake. She'd married um, Rochat, that's it. It was uh, Ida Rochat. Uh, she was also called Molly. Um, she'd married in Blue Lake in the early 1900s. Her husband then stole chickens and was sent to San Quentin. So here she was, this married, and then she ended up filing divorce woman living in Blue Lake on her own. So she opened a brothel between Blue Lake and Corbell. 
Um, it was called the Halfway House. There were a couple of other uh, names for it. Um, and she openly and not openly, she tried to get a liquor license a number of times and she was turned down. But she ran that house, um, ended up running a speakeasy out there. But Mamie Wright, the woman that I am also researching, she also operated a house out in Blue Lake at the same time she was in Eureka. Um, she called it the Community Club. There were a couple different names she had. Um, she got some attention out there. Uh, she also was not able to get a liquor license. Um, but yeah, so there were a few out there that operated openly. There were also a number of women, and this happened in Eureka too, women that would just rent rooms, right? They were independent contractors, if you were. And so they would meet their customers, say, in dance halls or saloons um, and, and then take them up. Um, others, waitresses or um, women in laundries, um, I would just about guarantee that the weavers who operated the brothel um, that was in the waterfront cafe, they owned the laundry across the street and, and there was a brothel upstairs above the laundry. And I guarantee you that they recruited girls from their laundry. Um, laundry paid terrible wages, like you couldn't even live on them. Um, and so it was a way to get girls to work as prostitutes for you. Um, let's see, someone said, um, I heard about a Trinidad prostitute named One-Eyed Mary or something like that, was told she was buried right outside the cemetery. Have you heard of anything like that? I have heard that same story. Um, I have not run across any firsthand accounts of her that I can recall right now, but I have also heard about her. Um, and there were brothels, there was actually opium dens and brothels in Ronerville, um, and those operated pretty openly too. Unfortunately, there was a working woman in Ronerville who ended up burned. Um, I can't remember if she was smoking a cigarette or something, but ended up with severe burns and the newspaper just said she'd been a prostitute working in, in Ronerville. Rio Dell, of course, um, there were some in Rio Dell. Um, the only woman in Humboldt County that openly identified herself as a prostitute was working in Hydesville. And in 1900 and the 1900 census, she actually lists her occupation as prostitute and she ended up in Rio Dell. Um, what was the typical cost for prostitutes? So it depended. So the only real reference that I have found in Humboldt County, um, so far I'm digging all the time, um, was from Mamie Wright's house. She had a $2 house, which was pretty typical, I think, because I've read, um, there's a vice report, great, fascinating vice report that was done in Portland in 1912. And the $2 house sounds pretty, um, pretty average. Um, and part of it, though, um, Mamie was African-American, but the women that worked for her primarily were white. Um, where African-American women, women of color, um, traditionally did not make as much uh, as white women did. Um, but $2 was probably about average. You know, in the cities, the cribs, uh, which were the one room, um, not always the greatest places, though some women would try to fix them up, you know, basically little houses or cottages. Um, they could charge as little as 50 cents the late 1800s, early 1900s. So it really varied. There was a house called the Everly Club in Chicago um, in the late 1800s where the ladies charged $50 a night. Which if you remember that conversion with poor Maisie who got arrested in the early 1900s, it's about $1,500 for a night. So it really varied like any other business, right? High class, low class, that sort of thing. Okay, um, do, you, do you find any documents about the brothel in Larrabee Valley? Vir Virginia's Ranch, something like that. Somebody mentioned that not long ago, um, and it sounds like it was operating through like the 60s or 70s um, when guys would go hunting. They'd maybe go out for some entertainment too. I have only heard things about that. I have not seen anything documented yet. But that's a lot further uh, forward, um, at least as far as I know. I mean, there may have been early brothels there, but I haven't heard anything about that. Okay. Were there any no native prostitutes? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and in particular, in the lower four, um, Emma Way was one in particular. She had grown up in Larrabee Valley um, in the 1880s. Um, it was a really ugly time, quite frankly, especially for Native Americans. Um, uh, a lot of the white men would take uh, Native wives, um, not even marry them necessarily, though sometimes they'd be referred to as wives. Um, Emma's uh, fam came from a family like that, a mixed family like that, and she was working uh, in a house in Eureka. But there were others. There were a number of others, yes. Okay. 
Um, and somebody did the math for us. Two dollars in nineteen thirteen was sixty dollars today. So thank you for doing the conversion. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Just while we're waiting to see if there's any questions. Um, so our presentation next month is going to be a little different. Um, you will be able to see it in person if you go to the Clark Museum. So if you want to go back to the in-person lecture, um, it'll be at the Clark Museum. And we are figuring out some way of doing a recording or a live stream. We'll find a way to have it online as well. So we're kind of working it out. So it might look a little different than normally, but we're trying out some new things, seeing what works. So bear with us if it gets a little funky, yeah. um, but we're going to make it work. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, Zoom and hopefully do the hybrid of the live and Zoom. So thanks. And thank you, Lynette. That was wonderful. Yeah, I also want to let folks know that I have put um, my email um, in the chat. Of course, if you've got questions, but even more important, if you've got stories for me or pictures, um, that might be able to help me with my research selfishly, I would appreciate that even more. Um, but please feel free to reach out if you've got follow-up questions. Um, yeah, I will be teaching a couple of OLLI classes and I'll go more in depth in this particular topic. We'll explore a lot more than I did here at the presentation. Great. All right, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Lynette. That was a great presentation. And um, we will see you all next month. Everybody thanks everybody. Thank you.